All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday or Thursday to you uh, if you're in the APAC region. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jennifer, and I have a few team members with me today, uh, and we're going to be talking about a few uh, topics related to the app maker to app sheet transition. Uh, a lot of these topics have been sourced directly from uh, our multiple communities. Uh, so whether the app maker forum, direct contact with our team or our app sheet community as well. And we're excited uh, to dig in. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd like to introduce the, introduce the team to you, excuse me. Uh, we have Christian Schalk, if you'd like to say a quick hello. Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, happy to be here. Uh, many of you may know Christian uh, previously. He worked extensively on the AppMaker program with Google before, and he's been helping those of us new to the Google family from the AppSheet team uh, learn a bit, little bit more about the product and a little bit more about all of you. Uh, next up, we have Peter Dykstra. Peter, if you'd like hey. to say hello. Hey, guys. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, you may know me from webinars like uh, AppSheet Office Hours. <laughs> <laughs> Making my Come. debut in the app maker world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter and I have worked really closely for the past few months in terms of education and training on the app sheet side of things. So thank you, Peter, for joining us. And then uh, last but not least, we also have Hayden. Hayden, if you'd like to say a quick hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Hayden. I'm a product consultant on the app sheet team. Perfect, and Hayden was also uh, with us last uh, webinar session, if some of you remember some of the sample apps that he built together. Uh, so thank you to the team for joining today. Uh, we're going to delve right into things. I already have questions popping up, uh, and let's get started with content. Cool, uh, so I can jump in. Uh, feel free to let me know, but uh, basically what we did was we, uh, we met several times and we went and uh, we looked over the uh, questions on the forum. Uh, we came up with this outline for this particular webinar. Uh, so Jennifer's going to kick us off by giving a little bit more uh, guidance on the licensing promo questions. And then we have uh, Hayden and Peter that are going to walk us through uh, essentially a set of demos that revolve around security, government, uh, domain access, et cetera. And then uh, we're going to wrap it up um, essentially with um, a, a walkthrough of how you could actually use webhooks uh, to connect to AppScript. Uh, so I'll actually be uh, walking through that, and then we just switch into Q&A. Um, so I'll go ahead and hand it back over to uh, Jennifer, if you'd like to go ahead and kick us off. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, those of you that have been AppMaker customers with usage, uh, we are offering a special promotion on the AppSheet product. Um, we've created a special hybrid plan for you that consists of our pro plan plus access to your Google Cloud SQL at no additional charge to your Google subscription. Um, that being said, there are a few features that we'll discuss today that I would highly encourage you to speak to someone on our sales team about to see if they're a good fit for your needs. Um, they may require an additional charge, but we find that a number of AppMaker customers have been more than satisfied with the special plan that we're offering at no additional charge for you right now. Uh, if you do not have access to a code yet, uh, the final slide in this series will list uh, how to access that code and we'll send instructions on how to kickstart uh, your complimentary AppSheet account. Uh, governance uh, is one of those features which we'll touch on in just a moment. Um, and again, uh, we're, we're happy to help connect you with a member of our sales team to be able to discuss some of these features a little further. Cool. So I'm going to go ahead and switch it to the next slide. And this is where um, I'll essentially be handing it off to primarily Hayden and Peter. Uh, so if you guys want to drive it from here on, I'm happy to step uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So. Um... We're going to talk briefly about a few security topics, um, starting with the concept of governance. So governance refers to the ability to set certain policies at the account level uh, across all of your applications. And you're able to do that um, through the app sheet uh, management section of our website when you create an account. So what you're able to do is create certain policies that um, uh, allow and disallow certain actions across your team, for example, you're able to determine who is permitted uh, among your organization to create apps, who is permitted to deploy apps. Um, you can set policies around uh, 
whether sign-in is required across all of your applications or not. Um, and you could potentially set it such that apps can only be shared with a specific email domain. And so uh, a policy kind of consists of three different parts, being a condition, which is a, a constraint that's checked on each app. Um, you're able to set the severity of that policy, so whether uh, that action is explicitly disallowed or whether a, an error or warning is displayed. And then you're able to set when that policy is checked. Um, so uh, the most common use case is that you'll set the app policy check on the deployment stage. Um, so when you deploy the app, it'll check that these parameters are met and either disallow the creation of an app or, um, or give you a warning that you're gonna have to click through. So I can show you really quick um, what that looks like in the actual interface. So I'll share my screen now. There we go. So all of these settings are managed in the My Accounts page under Policies. Um, so you're able to add those various policies here. And here's an example of some of the policies that you were able to set. Um, additionally, you're able to control uh, domain authentication through this same panel. Um, so you're able to add your corporate domain uh, for authentication um, in, in the same interface. Um, what that allows you to do is um, integrate with Azure AD or uh, Google Groups or AWS Cognito, and you are able to uh, set policies that um, match, match to those groups. Um, another way that you can add your domain within an application is under, so we're in the app sheet editor now, and we are under the users tab in the quick navigation menu. Um, you are able to add your entire company domain as users all at once uh, under the, the users tab here. So you toggle add entire domain and you can uh, title your domain here. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a quick overview of our governance and uh, domain authentication abilities. Do we have any um, questions in the chat, Jennifer? No questions just yet on governance. Okay. So I think we're okay uh, to keep moving on. Yeah, I think we're okay to keep going. All right, Christian, handing it back to you. All righty. Um, so one thing that you noticed on that screen that Hayden just pulled up where you have the, the domain, um, that actually would uh, fit with your G Suite domain. Uh, so for example, I, I, I'm using like my own uh, demo domain and I just plug that into this particular setting and it, it controls everything just, uh, just perfectly. <clears throat> um, let's see, let's go ahead and continue on. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Actually, so that, one, mm -hmm. one thing I, I would like to add, if you can go back a slide, please, yeah. is so the domain access in AppSheet is different than your domain access with AppMaker. You can oh. share it with individuals outside of your domain, um, your G Suite domain, in terms of end users for your application. Your promo code is valid for users within your uh, G Suite subscription service. But that's not to say your end users have to be uh, explicitly dedicated to your organization. Um, so you can share it with, you know, Gmail users uh, and customers. There, there's a much more capability in terms of how you're able to share your application with AppSheet than you were able to share with AppMaker previously. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, okay, so I think we're, uh, Hayden, are you ready to show, I think you have uh, some demos here lined up. Um, I can go ahead and, um, Switch it back yep. to you. <clears throat> okay. So, so sure. if we're cool. moving on to the um, <coughs> to the next slide, Christian. So now, um, touching on uh, the next topic, we're going to look at a basic document approval workflow. Um, so what we're looking at here is an application, the uh, the simplest bare bones application to get um, a a given document approved. Um, we're looking at the emulator here on the right-hand side, 
And here um, we have a slice, which we've created, um, which is showing us entries that belong to us in the table documents. Um, so the way the slice works is that we have the, the overarching table documents, uh, which contains each of the entries for our documents, which are in the process of being approved or have been approved in the past. And we've created a slice of, of that, which filters to only documents which belong to the user. So Just here are four question, documents. Are, are you presenting your screen, uh, Hayden? Uh, let's, I believe I am, but let's. Yeah, yes, look. Hayden. Hayden's visible. Oh, okay, good, good. For some reason, it wasn't coming up on mine. Okay. Great. Um, so what we're looking at here is four documents in the emulator at various stages of the approval process. These two, you can see, have already been through the workflow and have been approved and have some conditional formatting applied to them based on that status. One has been rejected and uh, one is in progress. So how this works is that when you create a new entry in this table and uh, add all of the relevant information here, um, it triggers a workflow. So we'll hop over and see what that looks like. Um, when a new entry is created in the table, uh, what it does is that it will send an email to the approver um, that you've designated here in this section uh, under reviewer and reviewer email, and it'll send them an, uh, an email letting them know that uh, they have an action to complete in reviewing um, the document that you've submitted. Uh, once this has taken place, um, it will appear in a slice uh, for them under review required. So the way that works is when you when you create your new entry and you set your reviewer, uh, we have a separate slice here under the uh, documents tab titled review required. So what this does is it shows only uh, out of the, the subset of all the documents involved in this app, um, it'll show you only documents where you are listed as the uh, review required uh, user, so the approver for this document. And off of this slice, we've built the review required view. Um, so let's have a look real quick. Uh, we have our reviewer is Sam at godo.com. And if we preview the app as that user, we will see uh, that that entry, IoT blog post that I've created with Sam as the uh, approver, shows up in the review required slice where it didn't for me. If we click into that, we're able to see the details of that document. We're able to navigate to that document via a link and review it. Um, and then we've created two actions here, which are part of the process. Um, we can either approve or reject uh, this particular document. And these actions were created under the behavior section in the quick nap menu. And uh, what they do is fairly simple. They uh, simply set the status of this row or this document to approved in the case of the uh, approve action or rejected uh, in this case. And now once I have approved this document, uh, supposing I approve it and refresh, I will switch back and preview it now as uh, our original user being Hayden at appsheet.com. And you'll notice that the IoT blog post is now approved and its status is set as such in the backend data. Um, so that's kind of a, a really quick walk walkthrough of a, a simple document approval app. And you have access to this uh, through my public app portfolio. And we will provide a link in the chat um to to this particular app as well as in any follow-up documentation that we send out so you can play with this app uh and modify it to to suit your needs and actually hayden i would love to post this in the community rather than the chat um so everyone just uh be on the lookout in the community thread we posted for you there excellent thanks jennifer yeah all right christian i believe you're up next um, actually, I'm uh, going to pass it over to, I believe, Peter. Uh, Perfect. Feel free to jump in, Peter. Sure. All right, Peter, passing over to you. All right, so um, 
the topic that I wanted to touch on was it's it's real relevant to what um, uh, what Hayden is already digging into. It's and it's important for building any really valuable application, which is uh, building relationships between the tables you've connected. And this is the the idea of um, you know relational databases or uh, relational tables is um, you know maybe already uh, very common or um, you may you might already be very familiar with it um, but we just want to make it crystal clear how to be able to um, establish those relationships in AppSheet and so I have a real simple example that we can uh, look at um, as a place to start let me just so what we see in the background here is a, a real simple application that has two tables and I'll show you what those tables are um, they're coming from a Google Sheet right now and the two tables consist of buildings so we've got some uh, medical centers with addresses and images and then we also have items that are going to be in those buildings and the items just have a little bit of detail they have uh, an image and then they also have a status and then the last column um, is a value to designate which building those items are in and that's this is going to be a key to building a relationship to this other table um, and and so and sorry i i, I used the word key kind of flippantly um, <laughs> but uh we'll we'll look at how they've been connected to the application why why key is significant so in the editor uh back in the editor here we have that building table and we have the items table. We'll open those up. And what I really want to have happen is in the application, I don't want to just build independent views um, showing you know, the list of buildings uh, and the list of items. The functionality I want is to be able to look at a building and then see all the items within it. Um, and the way that you do that is to establish a ref column type. So in my items, the, the column for building, instead of it just being a text value, I'm gonna look at, open up the column types, and there are a variety of them, but the ref is, is significant. And when I, when I select ref, I also just jump into the column definition. So this icon here on the left, and what I'm establishing here is basically just saying the value for this column is going to reference this separate table, the buildings table. So when I've done that, it, it does a few things here. So now it's gonna start looking for, um, anytime I'm creating a new item or I'm looking at an existing item, whatever value that is going to display for the building is it's going to go look into this table um, and it's going to look for what the key is so this will this will be kind of the unique identifier for the building in this case it's just the name of the building um, which I know are unique but that that wouldn't be a best practice long term um, and then uh, so it's going to find that building and then it's going to display whatever is checked as the label so we'll show you what this looks like so we have some existing, those items here are existing. And so the effect is, if I look at surgical masks, I can see in the details of the surgical masks that uh, build the building medical center A is showing up right now. The name is showing as the label, and also there's a tiny little image there. And that's because I've selected that image as part of my label. Now when I, when I select this this building, right, it it brings me to the listing uh, from the buildings table. It gives me those details there. It also shows me then all the other related items associated with this building. So by establishing this relationship here, you end up opening up the door to um, different ways of of listing associated items. Uh, navigating throughout your application and then um, lastly when you're filling out forms so right right here I just open up the form to add a new item um, it produces um, a real intuitive drop-down option 
So for that particular field, uh, when I'm when I'm uh, adding a new value, it's going to say, okay, you have uh, whatever is in this table to choose from. Um, and then I've also enabled this to allow I could add a new item to that particular table as I'm adding a new item as well. Um, sorry, so so I guess just to step back, that's a quick run through. Um, but uh, from from the from other um, other presenters or anyone else uh, listening in, any any questions or anything to help clarify? Oh, questions regarding references, not not just yet. Okay, but for though for you guys, um, for Jen and Hayden and Christian, is there anything else you'd like to add on, just to add a little clarity to this? I think that, you covered uh, it as far as I could see. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can definitely take questions um, as we wrap up. I think. I think the coming from an app maker perspective is just knowing that you know uh, relations um, pretty much map uh, fairly well with the, how you can set up the reference uh, type column um, and yeah cool so yeah, I think and, you explained it well. oh sorry Hayden I think you explained it well um, and you can use this kind of functionality to set up different relationships between your data like uh, parent child relationships uh, one to many relationships. So suppose you have, um, you know, um, a list of inspections and you have uh, a list of buildings, for example, you can associate many inspections with one building. Uh, and it, it's just a way to think about kind of um, r relating your data in ways that are uh, useful to your, uh, to your particular business use case. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on two more uh, things that kind of uh, come along with this once you've established a relationship. So. One is, uh, once I've set this column type and I hit save, you'll notice that um, in the other table that you're referencing, a virtual column is created. And this virtual column is a list type, and that's gonna be that list of related items. And so um, this list will automatically appear, and what it's saying is, uh, for this particular building, the row that I'm looking at, show me the list of all the related items. Um, and that's what we're seeing over here in the application. When I pull up uh, Medical Center C, then it just looks through the entire list of items and displays for me everything that um, uh, as associate, is associated with that, with that particular building. One thing that I find helpful is uh, if you click on the info uh, tab on the left, it also kind of visually gives you a, a feel for like the data and how they relate to each other. Um, so this is kind of a, a, I thought it's a pretty nifty tool, uh, just from a visualization standpoint. Peter, I have a great question for you from Tim. Uh, he asks, can a table have more than one relationship? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I can, I can grab that. So yeah, you can set up uh, any column in your in your data set as a, a reference to another table. So you can have as many references as there are uh, columns in your data set. Uh, similarly, there's no upper limit to how many references can be pointed at a given table. Um, yeah, um, actually, uh, I guess I won't pull up another example, but yeah, I have, uh, you know, this is a good place to start. Um, I have some applications that have, you know, dozens of tables and then, uh, you know, many dozens of references amongst all those tables. Um, so it's, uh, it definitely can, it scales up easily. What, one thing I found though was, was quite helpful was like, um, I would actually take like a, an app maker app that had a relation, for example, like a one-to-many relationship. I would export that out to a, a sheet. So you can do that within the app maker um, feature where you just uh, dump the entire set of models and it also preserves the relationships. And then I was able to go into AppSheet and essentially base the application in AppSheet off of that sheet that had the essentially related uh, sheets together. And uh, mm -hmm. it would usually pull up the relationship, uh, the references automatically. Uh, but uh, I found that was actually kind of cool that you could do that. Um, also with the Cloud SQL backend, I've also found that when you have your data model that have foreign key relationships, uh, AppSheet is also able to, to read that and, and build the proper um, references for you. But Got it. Great, and there have been a few um, requests for examples shown. 
of that and we'll actually post uh, sample apps. It sounds like we have a few available in that community thread uh, for you all. Cool. Jen, can I add uh, one more thing and then we can keep moving on? Yeah, go for it. So the <clears throat> I, I mentioned that using this building name uh, as the key is not really a best practice. Um, you know, I, I just wanted a real simple example in this case, and I knew each building name was unique, but because the key, um, you know, should be a unique ID, um, generally recommend having a dedicated column for that ID or for the key. And when you do that, if the column name is something like, like in this case, if I add a column and I make it ID, and I go back into AppSheet, I regenerate it. Um, so what this is doing is it's just syncing the table and it's identifying that there's a new column here. And um, it doesn't have any values, but because it, the column is ID, um, very frequently what it will do is it'll set the initial value as unique ID. Now this, in this case, I had already established something else as my uh, key and so I think it threw it off. Mm -hmm. But a, an easy way to do this is in the initial value for this column, if you just use the expression unique ID, then every time you add a new value to this table, you can ensure that you have a unique ID associated with it. And would you set the key also to uh... Oh yeah, sorry. So then then this would become the key. Thanks. Yep. Thanks, Christian. And then I'll I'll leave the label the same as the building name and the image. I do have uh, one more question on keys and then we can move on to the next topic. Um, the question is, can AppSheet use the unique ID primary key from Cloud SQL or only natural keys? Um, sure. So if, if that uh, unique ID exists in your data in tabular form, so it's like a, a value recorded in a column, uh, then you can certainly ingest that data and set that as the key uh, for your data in AppSheet. Um, well, and I believe there was, a, there was a second part of that question, Jennifer. Was there a, a little addendum that I missed? Uh, AppSheet used the unique ID primary key from Cloud SQL oh, or, or only natural keys. So I, I think you, you encompassed um, the entirety of that question, your answer. Right, Tim, yeah, so you can use both. Um, yeah. you, if, if there's a, a, a column in your data um, that is naturally unique, you can set that to the key as well. Um, typically, uh, you know, the most common use case uh, we see, people are building ID columns with a, you know, randomly generated alphanumeric key for each entry, but it is possible to set uh, your key to a, a natural ID. Perfect. Thanks, Hayden. And Tim, if you have any more questions regarding keys, uh, feel free to either post on the community or um, drop a few more questions in the box. Yeah. Uh, one more quick uh, add-on to that is that if you have um, two columns in your data set that the, concatenat the concatenation of which is a natural ID, uh, you can add a virtual column um, and then concatenate those two columns into a, a single column and use that as your key as well. If no... Uh, uh, you know, single column generates a natural ID, but a combination of two do, you can use that as well. So, I find sometimes that that gets generated automatically uh, sometimes um, just, you know, from, from building apps that have like, for example, first and last name, it sometimes creates like a virtual column where it concatenates the, the two and it uses that. Is that the typically uh, standard behavior, I guess? I think that there are some combinations of values uh, which would cause uh, so some combination of column uh, values wherein AppSheet might identify that you would like to see a uh, you know a concatenated column, um, but those those kind of examples are, are few and far between. Um, I'd have to do a little bit more research before I could point towards specific combos that it uh, will automatically generate a virtual row based on those. Yeah, I think I think the first uh, Christian I think your first and last name example is the most common right. and then and then um, if there also happens to be no other ideal key then it might select that as the key for you 
Yeah, I sometimes had to back out of it because a lot of times the, some of the demo apps I was building would have the same first and last name and then it would complain. So I had to switch to uh, do what you did where I created my own key or my own uh, ID generator, but yeah. Just a side topic, I um, and this is more or less the question to the folks out there. Um, you, you may have noticed that when you pulled up the expression editor, there's like a lot of different cool things you can do with the expressions. And uh, I almost wonder if like maybe that would be like a future topic to kind of dive into that even and more deeply. But um, it's a very rich uh, uh, tool, essentially. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll give a uh, just on this topic, there's just a little bit of a shout out. There's actually a, a real significant amount of, uh, of uh, 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 activity going on in the community is revolving around expressions. And so if you go to the community and you look at the expressions tag, um, a lot of discussion is around how to just use these in creative ways. Um, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of ways to kind of manipulate your data and, and make it really useful without having to, you know, add more physical columns, for example. One thing that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, like people often look for reg regular expression support, and I don't believe that's uh, built into this currently, right? Or at least, yeah, that's no, <laughs> so it's, the. I think the best way of thinking about it, it no, and Hayden, correct me if I'm wrong, um, mm -hmm. I think that it's not um, supported. The best way to think about these expressions is that it's like 80% what you'd expect in um, Excel or Google Sheets, and then 20% unique to AppSheet. One other observation that I had was like uh, in AppMaker, it's very common to use like um, statements that are essentially JavaScript statements. So for example, concatenate would just be a plus between two items. Um, mm. You can't do that here. So you have to actually use concatenate for this particular example. But uh, once you get your head around it, then it's like, oh, okay, it's more of like a traditional spreadsheet type of a formula generation, I guess. <clears throat> right, and, and that really speaks to trying to empower those who aren't developers. So a lot of you joining us this morning might be more technical, and you might start to notice the concatenate example that Christian just shared as one of the subtle differences. But we found that it's actually opened up application development to a number of people who weren't able to do so before. And that's one of the reasons we're so passionate about this product, is it's really democratized the process of building applications based on your spreadsheets and data, which is pretty cool if you ask us. Um, but anyways, gentlemen, I'd like to move on to the next topic. We have a few questions pouring in, but we can tackle these at the end. Does it sound? Sure. Okay. Let's hop in. Perfect. Um, next up, Peter, are you um, touching on intelligence next? I think we had, uh, at least on the slides, we had a demo for uh, dependent dropdowns before jumping into Peter's uh, um, intelligence yeah. Great, yeah, perfect. Yep. All right. Uh, happy to jump in if you'll uh, give me uh, a screen. Absolutely. Okay, so this topic um, is a little bit uh, in the, the deep, arcane mysteries of AppSheet. So we have this behavior uh, that we want to create, um, which we're going to call a dependent dropdown. And for example, we'll be looking at the sales lead tracking app, which has an example of that. So first, to look at the, the behavior that we're trying to create. Here we have a list of leads. We're going to add a new lead. And uh, frequently, um, our customers, um, when they're filling out a form, would like to have a, a drop-down uh, selection menu that is the content of which is contingent on an earlier entry in that form. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll select a, a region. Uh, in this case, we'll select America. And then the, the drop-down that's generated, you'll notice, only um, contains countries uh, which are in the Americas. So um, if, similarly, if we switch it to Europe, now the dropdown contains countries uh, which exist in Europe. So this is the concept of a dependent dropdown. And that's what I'm going to show you really quick um, how you can create and use for yourself. So um, in our app here, we have two tables. We have the leads table where we're recording these entries. This is what our form is based off of. And then we have this, this important concept, which is a lookup table, which we will use to create our dependent dropdown. Um, so the creation of a dependent dropdown uh, is actually fairly uh, simple to set up um, because AppSheet does a lot of the work for you. Um, and uh, you might, uh, it's not the most intuitive route, but it is certainly easy to use. So um, in our leads table, we want to set up a dependent dropdown 
uh, around uh, region and then uh, the countries that are displayed after. So the way we do that is you set up a valid if statement. Um, so we're in the da data view. I've clicked into uh, lead region and uh, we'll look at the data validity settings here. And we have a valid if statement that's saying, hey, um, this entry is valid uh, if, when you look at the, the lookup table regions, if um, it is an entry in the column uh, region. So it's gonna show you only regions that appear in this lookup table. So that's the, the how we set up our initial kind of uh, button selection. And then if you um, want to set up a dependent dropdown, um, you additionally go to the, the next column that you'd like to have the dependency uh, you know, factor into, and we'll set up another valid if statement there. And so this valid if statement says, hey, um, uh, this country should appear in the results if uh, when you look at the, the um, table, the lookup table regions, it appears in the, uh, the, the country entries. Um, and so what AppSheet does is when it sees two of these valid if statements, uh, one after the other in a form, it um, automatically figures out that you're trying to create a, a valid if or a, um, a dependent dropdown and will pull in that functionality for you automatically. So just to get a look really quick at the, the underlying data here um, in, our, in our lookup table, if we click uh, view data, it's very simple. Um, this lookup table only contains uh, three columns, our, our row number, um, which in this case is serving as our key. Um, we have the region. So we've got uh, these three regions, each of which corresponds to a number of countries. So when AppSheet sees uh, those two um, uh, sequential valid if statements that are uh, references to this lookup table, it will automatically create that, that valid if uh, dropdown functionality for you. Um, and so um, again, uh, you have access to this app. Uh, we'll put it out in the uh, through the vectors that Jennifer described earlier, and you can play around and kind of customize this to your needs. Additionally, we have some really uh, great support documentation that you can review, um, which goes into this topic in, in greater depth and kind of explains some of the, the black box functions that uh, AppSheet is performing intelligently based on you know, the input that you've provided. Um, do we have any questions about um, this functionality? If not, uh, we can move on to the, the next topic. Uh, no questions about functionality. Uh, I want to do a quick sound check, however. Um, I have one or two people commenting that they've lost sound. Can you hear us okay now? Just want to confirm. Okay. Um, I do have one. Okay, it sounds like we're doing okay on sound. Uh, I have one question, actually, that I'd love to run by a Hayden. Um, okay, great. The, how does that example of regions... Actually, let me make sure I'm stating this correctly. How um, that example of regions and countries could work on how how could that example of regions and countries work on Cloud SQL? On Cloud SQL, um, so Cloud SQL would be a a data repository. Um, so um, it would function exactly the same if your data is set up the same. So if your if your tables are structured. Uh, and connected in the, the way that I've described here, whether they're hosted in Cloud SQL or in a Google Sheet or um, you know some other data source, um, AppSheet will treat it exactly the same and you'll be able to create the same functionality. There's nothing special that you need to do if that uh, data lives in Cloud SQL. Perfect. Um, Rob, I see your questions on keys. We'll touch on these uh, near the end because you've had a few great ones. Uh, Danielle, and I apologize if I'm stating your name incorrectly. Uh, question is, do you plan on developing new widgets and features in the future, such as views, action, workflows, et cetera, or give the community the opportunity to create new ones? Um, um, Peter, if you'd like to touch on this. Yeah. Or so. <clears throat> That, I mean, that's a broad, uh, a, a, a broad question, but there's actually a real interesting component of that, which part of the uh, interface the UX team is working on, which is 
the idea of um, giving kind of flexible components that could be potentially sourced through like a shared marketplace or just an open source, not open source, but rather crowdsourced um, contributions to the app interface. So this, this could be in the, the theme of like a template um, that, uh, the, for example, if you've experimented with the card views, um, the idea would be you might have different manipulations of the components within a card view. And instead of AppSheet providing all the variations of that, uh, you might be able to mix and match and then share those with other users. So those are, it's very early stages. There's nothing to announce yet, but there's definitely a lot of thought putting into how the interface of the app could be um, uh, templated and or, um, you know, kind of uh, redefined by users as they find good uh, ways of interfacing with the apps. And just to add on to Peter's point and take this a little more broad, um, we actually source a number of, or, or it helps inform our decision in terms of what features we decide to roll out in the future based on our community feedback. And we have a, a feature request portion of our forum, and I'll drop a link in the chat box, and you can see other previous feature requests. You can upvote. Uh, current feature requests that have been made. We tend to test a lot using our community. Um, and so that gives you some insight into in terms of how we've done things historically. Being part of Google, that might change a little bit, but our community is very important in terms of how we test and develop features moving forward. Cool. All right. Um, anything else to touch on for this particular topic, gentlemen? I have, I have no additional questions right now. No, I think we're good to move on. All right, perfect. And next up, it is going to... Peter. Peter. Peter's going to talk about intelligence, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> all right, Peter, yeah, it's all yours. On my side. Um, the next slide basically just kind of kicks it off. <clears throat> yeah, so, and I'll actually I'll switch over just as a quick... Sorry if anyone heard my dog uh, shaking in the background. <laughs> um, so there are a few things uh, that I just wanted to, that we can run through. And, and just to preface all this, it's going to be a, just an introduction to each of these ideas. Um, we can go a lot further within each, but it, um, the, the concept of using machine learning and just uh, more intelligent functionality to be able to build into that end application uh, is something that we invest a lot in, and there's a lot of uh, newer updates. Some are a little are considered more in beta. Some are more fully baked. Um, but the the main ones that I wanted to touch on today uh, in this session was a, a particular ex, uh, expression here that I'll show you called extract. Um, our smart assistant, which is like a smart way of searching your applications, uh, and then we have some predictive modeling, and then OCR modeling. And so I'll, uh, let's, let's run through each of them and I'll show you a quick example for um, how to be thinking about it and how to start testing it out right now. So let me, I'm gonna start with the concept of uh, extracting. And this is, this is um, uh, we're going to get to this intelligence tab uh, in a second, but I wanna start with this expression, which is available you know, anywhere uh, in the application and also doesn't rely, it's, it's, uh, it's available in all plan levels, um, whereas intelligence, uh, there's some uh, premium uh, functionality in intelligence. So <clears throat> in this example, um, this is an application set up purely just to demonstrate this expression. And the effect is if I take a lump of text, um, or uh, sorry, if I take an image or a lump of text, how can I extract certain values? So certain prices or dates or times or numbers from that uh, just kind of like bulk text. Um, and in this case, let me actually, I'll just show you the an effect. I have a picture of a page this is actually the back cover of the book Hamilton. And there's a ton of stuff going on in here, 
All right, we've got numbers here in the barcode. We've got real small fine print footer. We've got three paragraphs of text. And within this middle paragraph, we actually have, you know, some, some written numbers, only two writers. We have six years later, there are more 200 funny revealing footnotes. Um, and so there are a variety of, of different, um, you know, pieces of data within just this paragraph of text uh, besides the other uh, text on the page. I'm just going to upload this image. And the effect right now is that this text field has just extracted all that it could find from this image. And then there's an additional layer of extra extraction going on from this text field. And so you can see like those numbers I was calling out have been extracted. And there's a date. Um, and then, you know, some, some of this, it gets a little bit, um, you know, the times that may, the accuracy may be declining at this point. The duration, I'm not sure exactly where to find that. Some of these numbers in the barcode might be confusing a little bit. But this is just like a rough example where, um, uh, of, of, of what you might be thinking about for extracting uh, data from, from kind of a bulk image or text. Like I'll, I'll give one more example here. I'm not sure if it, you showed it. I didn't quite see it, but like, uh, can you actually show the the expression or the function calls uh, within the yeah. field? Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, one second here. Um, I just want to show one more effect of it. In this case, it's just uploading. Um, let's see, a receipt. And then you can see how some of the prices are extracted, the numbers are extracted. Um, and so let's let's just actually look at these columns, like Christian is mentioning. What's going on here? Let me condense this a little bit. We have an image column and a text column. That's really all it is. And the rest are virtual columns. And this text column, the expression being used is just OCR text image. So it's saying, look at that image, extract all the text. And that's going to be the initial value. And then all these other virtual columns are more detailed extract functions. So extract prices or numbers or choices or emails. Emails or uh, app mentions, um, dates, though that's, uh, uh, they're particularly interesting uh, if you're trying to, let's say, just take a picture of like a page uh, and then get all the emails out of it, for example. So there's a lot, a lot to dig into here. Um, there is a dedicated help article if you just search in help.appsheet.com for extract that will give you kind of a full list of options here for how you can do it. But this is just one way to get started. And to clarify it, um, the column is that supplies the image is actually named image so that when he's putting the OCR text to extract that, that, that was what it was referring to as opposed to some kind of magical term or whatever. But oh yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's identifying the actual image column, those brackets pointing to this column above it. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're seeing here is this, that's that image column. This is the text and the rest are just virtual columns that as it finds values um, that meet these criteria, um, it will uh, present a value. So this is very open-ended, but a lot of creative things you can do with, um, you know, kind of refining bulk data. Um, the next, so the, the next couple items switches over to the intelligence tab. And I'm going to hop hop around a little bit between my windows. But within the intelligence tab, um, there are three different categories. And the first one is smart assistant. And this is just like a smart way of, of searching content in your application. So using natural language search, it tries to um, you know kind of find uh, the right filtered search results for you. And so I, I'm, I'm revisiting this. Uh, you know, the medical building and items application here. And <clears throat> just for clarity, every item has like an inventory status. Um, and then, uh, you know, just as a reminder, every building has multiple items. And so with Smart Assistant enabled, I can do something like, you know, if I go to in my menu, I go to the assistant and I say, um, show, oops, all caps, I'm yelling it. Show me all, let's see, uh, surplus items in building B. 
so with that sort of like natural language search, um, I can then, what it's displaying, and if I open this up, I can see that the, now correct me if my pronunciation is wrong, otoscopes uh, are surplus status and they're in medical center B. If I look at all of them, that's the only item that isn't surplus. And so you can do um, some of these natural language searches like that. And it's really helpful for getting uh, quick pieces of data. Tell me all uh, low items. Okay, so now I'm seeing everything that has low inventory status across all buildings. Um, this is really cool, and um, it, by default, it shows up in your menu here, and it should be on for any app you're creating. Um, I want to keep moving along here real quickly, but uh, anyone feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, so, <clears throat> Entirely different application. And I want to show you that the data it's based off of. This is switching over to the predictive modeling tab. I'll show you just one example of how to use predictive models. So, um, you know, without having to write any scripts, you're going to generate a, a model that will predict values from your data. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll show you an example of what this means here in a second, but the application that I've just switched over to is very simply, it's just feedback collected from employees um, about their job or about the company benefits. And I have a, um, in order to do this, I had an existing large data set with this information. And that's gonna be important when you think about the predictive modeling or the OCR modeling is you're going to need to come with an existing data set in order to train your app sheet model. And so in this case, I have a bunch of comments and I have existing uh, ratings and existing tags. So these tags are negative or positive. And that's what, I, that's, um, that's what I wanted to train this particular app to learn. So that when new comments are uh, added by employees, it automatically gets tagged with like a negative or positive rating. Um, so in the predictive modeling tab, I added a new model. And what's been defined is, first of all, okay, which table and which column would you like to predict? And so in this case, it'll be the tag. And then the inputs. So the inputs for these models, you could have uh, you know, many, you could have a dozen different fields. In this case, I'm only, I only want the content of the comment to influence the tag being applied. So not the employee location or their title or anything like that. And this one trained relatively quickly and you can see that it'll break out kind of significant words. Um, the significance, uh, the difference is, um, you know, I think you'll, you'll have to play around with this. Every model is different. Every data set is different. Um, but the at the end of the day, what you can do with it is automatically then, uh, by default, it will automatically set the initial value of that column to predict. And so um, I'll just show you this example here. Let's say, uh, and if it's our great, that should be an easy one. And so what it just did behind the scenes is it saved that entry and then it set the, the value of the tag to be positive. Now I also have a format rule that's making this green with a thumbs up. Um, and so then let's, here, let's try one a little, uh, let's say like the work days are not ideal. And that, let's see, that's a little more subtle. So that one got it. And I think I may have, you know, teed that up a little bit, you know, based on these keywords, but um, this is something that you can play around with. It definitely takes a little bit of optimizing uh, to get it to work in your app. But the key is that you can use this in a variety of ways to help pre-fill form values um, or you know, in, in smarter ways and in automatic ways. And then you can especially start thinking about how that might trigger other workflows to say like, okay, if I'm detecting this pattern in this area, then let's move some data, let's update some data, let's notify people uh, mm -hmm. of these things going on. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to rely on just the, the actual, the literal input from the end user. Um, so that's one way to think about predictive models. 
Um, I'm going to keep going on, but if anyone, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. And so then, just a quick time check. Uh, we're coming up at 25 uh, after the hour. Um, so, oh, good. So you're going to do the OCR stuff. This is a real simple one. And what this one, um, this is uh, in a similar way. So if you go into OCR and you create a new OCR model, this gives you the ability to um, uh, uh, take that image input and then scan it and provide an output for the selected fields that should be related to that image. So in this case, we have um, a real simple data set of badges with names, companies, and locations. And I trained this, um, this OCR model on those badges. I upload the images. And now uh, if I upload a similar image, the effect is, let's see who we have here, Oprah. Okay, let's upload Oprah. And so then it will pre-fill those values based on uh, what is detected in the image. So this is a little bit more specific way of extracting text from the image. Uh, but using this, you can think about using these OSR models uh, in addition to using that extract, um, uh, extract text uh, function. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and then I'm glad to follow up. I'll post some examples in the community. I'm also glad to follow up with anyone if you have uh, specific questions. Perfect. Thanks, Peter. Also, I'm a little bummed I didn't get to, you know, meet Oprah. <laughs> this <laughs> looks like you got to. Uh, yeah, that, that was the highlight of my day. <laughs> Taking a picture of Oprah's badge. <laughs> Perfect. That sounds great. Uh, all right. So as Christian mentioned, we are coming up a little bit short on time. Uh, there have been some really great questions that have come up regarding language. I know there was a request to cover um, whether or not we'd be available in Italian. Um, we have some great information on localization that I'll post in that community thread. Um, Rob, you had a few really great questions on keys, um, which I will post some additional information in the community thread as well as a few others. However, with the limited amount of time we had left, um, webhooks has actually been a, a really hot topic and Christian had uh, one quick area he wanted to cover. On this, so Christian, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, let me know when you can see my screen. And uh, we'll we'll tackle this big piece, and then um, any other questions that you all have, we can take into consideration for uh, the next App Maker to App Sheet webinar, which is actually going to be our final in the series, and that will be taking place, I believe, on April 8th, and we'll post more details on that in the near future. Okay, all right, cool. Christian. So I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll, this will be like a little bit of a teaser since we're a little bit short on time, but basically the idea is that, um, you know, with the ability to post essentially a webhook out to um, really any kind of like receiving endpoint uh, in AppScript, you can actually create your own uh, function that can be called by a webhook. Uh, so what I did was I actually created like a, a simple example that would actually do this. And I also made it somewhat useful where I made my AppScript code go ahead and call the directory API. And so the, the way it works is that this demo would take like an email, it would take that email, use the directory API, pull up some of the uh, user information, like first name, last name, and thumbnail uh, uh, URL, and then it would deposit it into a Cloud SQL database. And then from there, an app sheet app could then also just fetch that and start to use that as a directory uh, on its own. So just to kind of continue on here, I have a, um, and so this, I, I made it easy on myself. I just created a simple demo that just walks through it. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of cut to the chase. So that's just describing like the flow, like you, you're gonna have the application itself. It's gonna make the, 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 the request and the do post handles. And let me just fast forward a bit so we can jump to the chase. And hopefully you can see my screen, right? Ah, okay. So, so as I switch over, this is the directory of users within my G Suite account. So I can actually make uh, queries with the directory API on the, these different users. And so in this case, I have a very simple app sheet app where my data uh, consists of essentially just a single column where I'm grabbing the email, right? And then I go into the behavior and that's where I can specify the actual webhook. So I created this workflow rule. It's it it triggers when there's any additions or updates, and it calls this particular URL, which is my uh, app script endpoint. And I also encode what the column value for the email. 
And I also threw in an API key. I kept it simple for now, but you can throw it in. That way you can secure the, uh, the application. Now, again, this just a caveat um, that you would actually do it more like in a real application, you would, you'd want to set up something like with uh, um, OAuth, but that's something that's being worked on right now. But in any case, I, I went ahead and for this demo, I created it where if I go ahead and, and add like a, an email for Praveen, uh, it will actually trigger that uh, endpoint. And then I actually made a little a notification system where it sends an email. And so once the email comes in, it will say, okay, I received this, um, this uh, directory lookup request. And then it fetched it from the directory API and it actually pulled out down the thumbnail URL, et cetera. And then it also loaded it into the database as well. Uh, and so if I click over there on the database, I can see that I have this directory table and I'm gonna select star uh, from the, uh, the directory. And then now I have that record in there. And um, that's essentially what would give me the ability to uh, continue on in that case. So, that's more or less what I was going to show, although the code itself, I won't go through all the code, mainly from, from a time standpoint. Let me see if I can fast forward just a tad. So real simple. Um, the, it consists of the do post method. It, it's, first, it's checking for the, the API key that I'm just supplying it so I can kind of secure it. And then it has a, a bit of a, a call that it goes through and, and checks the user. So I have like the user, and that's actually a... Uh, directory API call where I'm actually fetching the, the given name, family name, and the thumb name uh, photo URL. And it sends it in the response back uh, to this record. And then I just insert into the, the, my database uh, this actual record here. So I, I created this write one record, which resides in this DAO uh, script. And that's essentially it. And so there's really not too much uh, uh, magic behind the covers. So anyway, we're going. Uh, over time, but I just wanted to kind of share that as a little bit of a teaser. We can go into more details uh, perhaps at a later date on, on some of the stuff you can start to do between both uh, App Sheet and then the, you know, the overall app script. And this is also a work in progress. We're in discussions with regards to making it a little bit more, uh, improving the connectivity and also improving like the capabilities to secure it, such as with OAuth flows and such. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Christian. Uh, sure. All right, folks, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, as we mentioned previously, we'll post uh, follow-up information uh, in the AppSheet community uh, thread that we've populated a few times here. Uh, thank you, Christian, for pulling this slide up. All of the resources on this screen here are great places to start uh, in terms of either learning more about the product, getting in touch with members of our team or the community to learn new how-to tips and tricks. Um, for those that have questions related to your account or the special promo offer that we have available, this am-appsheet at googlegroups.com, that is the best way to reach out to a member of our sales team uh, to discuss any outstanding questions you might have regarding uh, the special plan made available to you. For those new to AppSheet, highly recommend this AppSheet Udemy course. It's free of charge, it's relatively quick, uh, and it's a, a great way to get up and running with the platform quickly. And finally, we put together a special transition guide for everyone who came from AppMaker and is considering using AppSheet uh, to provide some additional resources for you in your transition process. Uh, thank you again to Peter, Hayden, and Christian for joining me today. Uh, as mentioned previously, April 8th is the last in this series. Peter and I actually separately have a office hours session we host every other week. Um, Peter, I think the next one is next week, if I remember correctly. And we tend to focus uh, predominantly on AppSheet specific um, topics. We don't typically discuss AppMaker, but it gives us a chance to dive deeper into the product on that. Uh, so feel free to join us for that, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>